And so we're going to have a very relaxed session. Um, by the end of this, the four panelists will have completely rethought business aviation. There'll be no such thing as an empty leg, um, apart from James on his way to the pub crawl. Uh, um, so we're going to solve the problem. So Max, take us through AvconJet, how you got involved in launching it and, and what's changed since then. Uh, we started Afconjet uh, 12 years ago in Austria, a very small operator starting off with one Citation Jet 3, then adding uh, in a relatively short time frame, adding other Cessnas, serving more or less uh, the local German-speaking market. Um, in the course of time, uh, we grew the company today to 65 aircraft, ranging now up to Boeing Business Jet. Uh, we have uh, three AOCs, San Marino, Malta and Austria. And we have one company on the Isle of Man. So basically, today, we are, uh, let's say, an international um, aircraft management company, uh, ranging all sizes of business jets, doing private flights and also charter flights. And you launched in, sorry, which year? Uh, in 2007. 2010. Bernhard, you got your AOC um, on a brilliant day that everyone will remember. Do you want to take us through that? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, I ran an Austrian AOC, um, established in 2008, and running a very light jet operation. So, many of you know me as the very light jet uh, dinosaur. Um, 2018, we operated uh, a bit more than 11,000 uh, passenger flights on a fleet of uh, 20 Citation Mustangs. And you actually got your AOC on the day that Lehman Brothers filed? That's correct, yeah. I was, uh, that's absolutely correct. And uh, was a good decision making. Should we continue or should we stop right now? Uh, we've decided to continue. And uh, yeah, we're still here. That's great. OK. So I think that's nice. 2007, 2008 is a nice starting point. Um, Annika, what was the typical way someone booked charter back in 07, 08? Um, Avano started 2002 and started changing how um, aircraft sourcing uh, is being made. So uh, back in the days, it was a very manual process of calling around, trying to find an aircraft somewhere around the world. And as Avanaut started the journey of bringing both brokers and operators into the system, it became much more uh, efficient and digital way of finding aircraft. So a lot faster and a lot easier to find availability. James, how receptive would you say business aviation was to new technology 10 years ago? Um, okay, so I mean, we, we launched Airing Direct in 2003 and then moved it into Europe in 2006. Um, I think that there was uh, elements of people that were looking to, they were seeing the, the opportunity of business aviation, obviously a lot of rapid growth at that time. And there was, I was absolutely astonished how, uh, how quickly you could do things with the right technology and the right uh, integration of, of information across the technologies that we're offering. And yet you went into some flight departments and they're literally almost got an abacus out to cal calculate things. And somebody sitting there opposite you, you've just done his whole job that took him a day to create a flight in, in about five minutes and sent in the whole flight plan and all the information that you would need within, you know, you could literally do a five minute demo and, and provide that. So we've continued to add, I mean, it's great seeing the, the whole thing about APIs just a moment ago. We've continued to, to, to do that kind of thing, integrating with a number of uh, best in class third party service providers, sometimes building our own stuff. Usually with what we're thinking about trying to do is simplify the user experience. And our next big step of, of this year is to really um, uh, launch our, 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 you know, our next generation of product, which will essentially put all of what you traditionally see on a desktop when you use as a, as a user now, to be able to do it flexibly through your mobile phone wherever you are in the world. Okay. But very receptive in places, but a little bit of reluctance at times because of the change in the jobs that people were going to have. So Max, your first customers, would, how did they book? Who were they? What was the average age? Did they use their PA to book? How would you describe it when you launched? Um, 
obviously at that time, yeah, uh, telephone and, and, and email was the prime means of, of booking a flight. Um, interestingly, up to today, that hasn't changed that much. Yeah? It's very interesting from our perspective. Uh, but we think it's just a matter of time that there will be a severe, drastic change. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> today we still have the same share. Yeah? We have, uh, if I look just on the charter side business, we used to have uh, 30% uh, end clients, yeah, which just were booking directly with Afconjet, uh, and the rest was uh, by the usual brokers. Uh, today we might see on our business side, uh, we see maybe 5% to the platforms, yeah? uh, still 30% the end clients, and then 65% with the brokers. So from today's, today's perspective seen, there's not a drastic change, but we are gearing up to a month. <coughs> I'm interested, so really just 5% from platforms. That's much lower than um, the noise. Yeah, interestingly, what we see on our side, uh, we have quite a, a, quite a big number of, of large aircraft, the Gulfstreams, the Globals, etc. Uh, we see uh, the highest share of the platforms uh, in the small aircraft business, uh, like Citation Shed, Excel, up to Challenger 350, like in that uh, segment. There we see a, a higher share. But on the large aircraft, yeah, like the uh, like Gulfstream 550, 650, Global Expresses, yeah, this is where we still have the usual breakup. Yeah. Bernhard, what's yours? I, I can share almost similar numbers. So uh, in preparation for this session, I looked up uh, in 2018, we had 12% uh, of our turnover uh, coming from platforms. However, uh, by talking about platforms, it's just uh, a front end. But the way we manage the back end is still very much old school, like back in the 2008 when we started. So as Max said, it's uh, email and phone calls. For the, by the back end, you mean for yeah, yeah. once the customer's booked, or are you talking about when you're dealing? The, 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 combination, the communication flow between the, the platform owner uh, and, and the operator. Annika, would you say this is, you get to see a lot of chartered booking and a, you, know, you get a lot of visibility or searches. Would you say this is standard? Um, I would say what is standard is that it's still a very manual process in the back end. So it's powered by different systems and it's powered by people. So Abnode alone integrates to 35 different scheduling software, which obviously makes it very difficult to make it digital and efficient um, while we have that very um, fragmented industry that we are in. I do want to say that, as uh, Noel, our CTI, a CTO, pointed out earlier, that <coughs> APIs is really opening new doors that with APIs and software as a service companies where you can start integrating. You can now start making efficiencies through connecting those dots and actually not having to invest in the full systems yourself, but actually um, getting onto those platforms where you think you get most uh, best-in-class services. So, James, what are your thoughts on how quickly we'll see the back end change? I mean, there's a, there's a great opportunity, I think, in democratization of, of access to, to uh, business aviation. Um, our best operators, if I if I analyse the you know the the, the cap, you know what's going on amongst our customers, they've seen like 15 to 20 percent increase in number of flights and flight hours. Without, net, without a set, the same increase in the number of aircraft. So there's a high rate of utilization going on. This, is gonna, this puts uh, pressure on operators. There's gonna be, they, they, they have to do a lot more quoting. Those quotes have to be accurate in order to make themselves more profitable. And, and, and this information, the opportunity for new, new people to come into the market and access, uh, access business aviation, I think that, I think that, that opportunity is still um, a really good one. There is still, though, obviously, that, that, that uh, traditional relationship with uh, the people that are chartering aircraft. And then you've got the other part, which is the, the change in whether or not people buy and use the aircraft personally or even as a corporation versus the opportunity to take a, a high-quality charter and, and almost have it as if it is your own aircraft. Yep. Um, I, I think... Oh, 
the last 10 years, a uh, company like yours have done a, a really brilliant job in, in automatize the, the flight operations. Uh, I mean, I just mentioned we performed 11,000 flights, and back in 2008, we had uh, on every flight a, a, a paper like this thick with us, and uh, it ha it's removed. Everything is not completely electronically, so we have this flight back all reports, uh, all flight plans, uh, whatever is needed for operations is completely digital and uh, various software products talking to each other, exchanging data, authorities have access. So this, I think the industry has done a great job here last 10 years. And then we have done, I think, um, a kind of good job on the front end. So how the, the customer or even the broker communicates to the industry. Uh, but I think we are lacking the, the middleware. So how we how we manage all the processes in between. You know, how we talk to f fuel providers, catering providers. Actually, how we are talking to the customers in a, in a bi-directional way, other than the phone. That I don't know. There's a slot here and so on. Um, how we talk to FBOs. How we talk to the airports. Here is it, it, it's, it's a lot of room to do. Max, do you agree with that? Is it this middle pit which is lacking the middle piece of the puzzle? Um, <clears throat> I agree, but I think there is some other pieces which are missing as well. Yeah? So um, we saw in the previous presentation that, that, that speed is important. Yeah? If a charter customer wants to book a flight today, he wants to do this more or less yeah, if the system would work perfectly on a phone and uh, see the exact price, see the routing, see the confirmation, and then just book it and get also the payment issue fixed. Yeah? And in this whole process, there are certain things missing. Yeah? For example, uh, we're missing the speed because we cannot get the, uh, the confirmation of the owner in time. Yeah? Uh, we cannot get precise cost yeah? because we need to have cost of the exact airport where the aircraft is flying. Yeah? We need to have the exact operating cost, yeah? which should be in the scheduling software of the operator somewhere, which is in most cases not the case. Yeah? Uh, we should fix the payment problem yeah? because most operators uh, demand advanced payment before we do a charter flight. So all of these things actually are preventing, in my opinion, from today's perspective, a disruptive technology change. But once we get it fixed, yeah, we should be ready to see that. But for the time being, we don't see it because fragmented is one of the keywords, Annika said, because the business and the software which the operators are using is fragmented. We are missing the APIs, we are missing the data. Yeah? And that, uh, that doesn't enable speed, what the client at the end of the day wants. Today he gets the speed, if he picks up his phone, he calls his favorite operator or broker, and then he gets speed. Because the human is then taking the phone in his hand, or her hand, and, and uh, contacting quite some operators, getting a, a quote, getting owner approval, and that, that all in a decent time frame. This is how it's happening today more or less. Uh, but if you get the other things fixed, uh, I think uh, we could see the disruptive change. But it's a matter of these points. Okay, we've got a question um, from Chris. If we could put Slido live. Do you, s you talk about sharing data. Do you see a time when smaller operators will openly share information? and join together to achieve more efficiencies. Bernhard? <laughs> I think at one point uh, the operator will recognize this is a necessity. Uh, we just talked in the morning there's a shortage of workforce. I, I do agree. On the other side, I can tell you that I have in my office um, three people just declining Avinote requests because we get overloaded of those and we have to manually separate them. Okay, this is we can do, we cannot do, and this is all a manual process. So I have three people doing only job just to clean things which could be done by uh, maybe deep learning, AI, whatever these new buzzwords are, and uh, I could use those three people uh, for a higher level of work. So, and, and by sharing data, and, and learning from each other, um, I think we, we, can, we can get the workforce, the need of workforce, the shortage of workforce, uh, much better fixed. And uh, we all know that if we share data, that we can learn much quicker. And then if you put on top of it uh, smart algorithms, um, the entire industry will uh, benefit. However, there's this, still these this small operators having a, a smaller number of aircrafts on the AOC, and we have to bring them on board and see, okay, uh, we, all, we all can benefit and we don't steal business from each other. So you would be happy 
to share your data today. Absolutely. Open book. Everybody will benefit. So what's the profit margin on a no, uh, um, Max, would you be happy to share data? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no, that's honest. Some things we're happy to share and some things not. Yeah? Um, obviously, if we have a, a share of end clients, yeah, uh, end customers directly, and there's no, let's call it a middleman, whether it's a platform or a broker, then obviously we would like to keep that share because obviously it keeps profit margin higher. Yeah? Uh, on the other side, yes, there's information we would like to share in order to gain from the market. Yeah? Um, but some, this is something which, which can be fixed by IT yeah, with an API and what information are you willing to share on the market? So this is a technical question, uh, but I think the main, the basis should be data yeah, to enable a, a precise costing to get the owner's approval and to get the financing for the flight. So just to summarize, you're willing to share the data that's not valuable to a <laughs> part. No, that's not correct. No, that's not correct. Uh, we're, we're willing to share the data uh, to be, let's say, in the market and to be ahead of the market. But uh, let's give it, an, let's give it a, a, let's say, a, a precise answer. Yeah? What would be not willing to share? Yeah? Customer name. Yeah? So maybe that's, uh, that's, that's easier to answer. Um, if you have uh, the client and we know the client loves a special cake. Yeah? And we know if the client comes on board and we provide the special cake and the special drink and provide him the special magazine, show him the special movie, then the next time he says, look, this is the company I want to go for. Yeah? So this is kind of like a very detailed special information, customer relationship management based, yeah? uh, which we would not be happy to share because we work to get this information. Annika, you, you'd be very happy to take all that data, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> And we see that uh, a few years ago, I feel it was more discussions around uh, uh, data, but more and more operators and brokers are opening up to share data to gain these efficiencies and to be able to link up the system. So it's becoming less of an issue, I believe. James, you love talking about big data. Um, so, I mean, first, we, at the moment, we're collecting a lot of data. And we, because we offer um, services to over four and a half thousand business jets worldwide. There's a big community that is actually gaining from uh, being part of that big group because a lot of our customers are the ones that come with the best ideas that we can move forward with. And those things are all then put into our software applications and, and a lot of people then gain from that, um, that, that service being enhanced in some way. So I think there's a, there's a, there is a great opportunity for, for collaboration. Uh, obviously, that you, you know, then you've got to t t figure out what it is that you're actually competing on, because you can collaborate over a lot of the commodity stuff, and then, you can, then you've got to add value at some other point in, it, in the chain. And I think that's where the, maybe the operators are, they've got that special relationship with someone, they know, them in, they know that person, then that's great. That's, what they, that's one of their value propositions for, for them. It, you know, we, we've talked a lot about data, or for the Americans, daughter. And um, it's, I just wonder if there's that much available that's that valuable. So I think last week, uh, Oliver from Amino, you know, use the industry figure of 35,000 customers. There aren't that many people. There aren't that many. And it's, it's such a lumpy industry that, you know, say one guy has a wedding and his daughter gets married in the south of France, you can have 15 jets fly to that. And then that's a significant number. Does anyone else agree that maybe we, the future of, you know, the empty legs? Lots of people have tried to crack the empty leg problem, but business aviation is such a complex we can barely schedule buses or trains. I wonder if we're all being too ambitious. I think that, um, sorry, I think that uh, the thing about aviation is an awful lot of it's quite predictable. So there, there is some opportunity there to kind of resolve the, the chaos problem of, of, of looking at aviation. And, and then, uh, as Lisa was saying earlier, like think, think about these things a little bit bigger and then think bigger again, because the, the, the opportunities are not necessarily going to be um, you know, huge changes that, 
that you know, and even if you did manage to, to, to cotton on to some huge disruptive change, someone else will start copying it almost straight away. So, but you can make small marginal gains, that, and that's what you need. You need uh, the, the, the continuation of those small marginal gains, and it's really, I think it's probably that, it's that game of inches to quote Al Pacino from. Okay, it's a question from Chris P. I'm guessing that's Chris Partridge, uh, but apologies if it's not. Uh, what is the simplest thing that can be done to make Charter truly a product for the people? Bernhard? How can you make Charter a product for the people? I think, uh, first of all, we need to build the backend and the infrastructure. And, and here we need more data standards. If you look at other industries, like the automotive industry, for example, uh, even if they're competing in the same market, but they have standards, they have established standards on, on data, how data exchange to suppliers, uh, to design uh, studios, to engineers. And uh, once we have uh, data standards, we can more focus on, on creating a product uh, where the customer appreciates and, and um, make, make it a real product. It's, it's a service industry, it's a people business, so we need to create standards that we can focus actually on the customer and it, not to get the operations done. Annika? So to open up to a broader market, um, I definitely think we need to solve many of the back-end issues with price and availability, so that will obviously be key and technology will play a big role there. I also think that group comes with a whole set of other expectations in terms of how they want to uh, book the service and also have the service delivered. And so we need to be prepared to meet those expectations with ease of use and availability and correct data um, before we can do that. Uh, we've got another question, which is, uh, when will Avanode offer the buy now button? to stop the inefficient negotiating and speed up the process. I think that was from Oliver. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stefan from MHS Aviation, who is speaking tomorrow, so you can have your chance to get him back. Uh, uh, so this is something that we have been discussing, is should we just put in a book now button into Avinode? Um, and it will probably drive some behaviors, but we have also said that we need to look into the uh, ability to actually reflect availability and pricing in a good way before we put that book button in. So uh, it's something that we are getting closer to, but we're not really there yet. Okay, here's a really nice question. Ticket price is the driver of volume slash efficiency. What is being done for it to drop by a third or half? Max, could you actually drop your charter rates lower and be profitable as a company? Yeah, there would be several ways uh, to drop the price. Yeah? Uh, one would be maybe uh, if, you, if you just look in, at an organizational level, yeah? uh, then obviously size brings advantages. Yeah? You can cut costs by negotiating hard and tough on the market, and this enables you to offer the services uh, uh, more cost-effective on your side. Uh, obviously, then there's a, a regulation side attached to it. Yeah? If you look into Europe and how fragmented uh, the air traffic control is today compared to the US side, uh, there's quite a lot to take here yeah, and uh, look at how many people are employed uh, by, the, by the government agencies. Yeah, so uh, making or rendering the service is actually pretty expensive. Um, obviously, there's a technological side yeah, which is coming more and more. Uh, aircraft uh, like the the latest, I don't want to say the name, or the latest additions from the OEMs, yeah, which offer basically the same cabinet, one third less operating cost. Yeah. So there are, in my opinion, several ways, and there is a, a technology, IT technology side as well, uh, which is Ring basically pretty good at. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, a dispatch, yeah, uh, we have presently in the company 24 dispatchers. Yeah, that is a substantial cost side. Yeah. And if, uh, if Ring or any other provider, and I know there are some here in the room, uh, developing this or having developed this, yeah, can offer solutions which, with which we can work with less people. Yeah. But for the same result, obviously also that will bring cost down at the end of the day. And this is what we are pursuing. Bernhard, can you get costs down by a third and still make money? I don't think so. Uh, if you look at the various balance sheets from operators or on, on, on airliners, the absolute number one cost driver is, is, is the asset. So it's, it's acquiring the asset and maintaining the asset. And as long those costs are not going down, I don't have uh, much hope that 
it can be done cheaper. And then on the second side is um, was the number two line item, cost item is stuffing. So uh, we need a lot of stuff uh, to get the back end fixed. So right now the issues we have on the back end is done by manual work. So I think this is a, a focus uh, to put on that we get the back end fixed, that we can reduce uh, the, the manpower uh, are there, and then then the costs will drop for sure. Okay. I think the uh, the key thing here is um, it's about uh, the the problem of uncertainty. So, business aviation deals with non scheduled ad hoc on demand uh, access to aircraft. If if we can uh, gather information, process it in a more predictable way, then we can reduce the amount of uncertainty that's already in the system. And I think that there are some really good things that, you know, things like long-term weather forecasts, the increasing predictability of that, the understanding of the atmosphere, the ability to, you know, the new technologies that are coming that will allow us to, uh, to, to deal with that big environmental issue, which obviously affects the, how long a flight lasts and how much fuel is burnt. Um, and also uh, understanding all of your costs in a, in, a, in a more predictable way. So having that information again and being able to process it in such a way that, that when, you're, when someone picks up the, answers the phone or, or deals with a platform inquiry, uh, that they can quote that trip accurately in order to, to offer it both competitively and profitably. There's a, another um, interesting question. Have the new platforms that have been created increased the volume of flights? Or has it just been a different communication channel? So online charter booking, I can see a lot of the leaders of this industry here. Have they actually brought new people in, or have they just got existing customers to book differently? Any thoughts? Um, definitely new customers. Yeah? So uh, if you open up a new kind of, uh, let's say, sales distribution channel, then this brings in new people to the industry, so basically it's positive. Yeah? Um, uh, Chet Smarter, remember, selling the ferry flights, uh, putting 10 people on an aircraft, uh, brought people into a business chat, and uh, usually, you know, still a ticket is not cheap. Yeah? People develop, and at one point, they might get uh, a charter customer for a bigger sized aircraft. Yeah? So, what we, uh, what we need to get rid of is a little bit the barrier to entry. Yeah? And the more we offer on the lower end, the more people will get into the industry and into the business and more acquainted and, and, and uh, accustomed to using business chats as it is in the US. Yeah? If you compare the US market and Europe, you will find eight to nine times more aircraft than the US. You have approximately the same number of <coughs> billionaires and millionaires. Yeah? But why are there eight to nine times more aircraft there? So there's obviously... Uh, the US people have, a, let's say, a, a, they are less afraid of using a corporate chat. It's more normal there. Yeah? And this is where we have to get to. So there's an interesting poll at the moment. Can operators cut costs significantly? And I think it just tells you that 48% of the audience are operators. Uh, <laughs> saying, no, we've gone as low as we can, and the charter brokers and others um, are winning in 52%. Um, okay, it's the Uber question. Why have we not seen an Uber for our industry? Lots have tried. Um, many more have been announced. What would it take for it to happen, Annika? Well, I don't think you can underestimate all the work required on the broker side to, uh, to make a charter happen with all the back and forth between the brokers and the operators um, that still remain. Um, I think with the fragmented industry that we're in, there are many issues that need to be solved before we can uh, to make that happen. So open it up to a, a broader market will require that we um, have new business models. I think seat sharing and membership models will come into play. I think technology needs to drive more efficiencies uh, in how we can actually enable a booking all the way through. So it's, it's not that easy and uh, due to fragmentation, digitalization is taking more time in a very complex industry with regulations, etc. Well, the significant uh, amount of effort goes into continuously quoting for trips that are then either not taken or are cancelled. I mean, you don't get to do that with an Uber as often. <clears throat> if you look at Uber, what, what does it make us successful? Uh, you, you take your phone in your hand, you look at it, 
uh, you request uh, from here to Heathrow. Uh, you get the timing when the, ta when the taxi arrives. Uh, you get a price and you know the driver and you know uh, the asset which is driving you there. Yeah? So basically this is missing in business aviation. We don't have the cost. Yeah? We don't know the time. Yeah? And then we cannot pay it with our own credit card. Yeah? So if we fix that, and that means that uh, the, the scheduling softwares by the operators need to provide APIs, uh, the softwares need to be fed with the corresponding data, uh, then we will see the Ubers coming. I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, many people were biased by the, the Uber thing and, and uh, thought to bring it to business aviation. But I think we heard it uh, this morning, uh, the market is very limited. I, I remember there was a number about 200,000 people can afford a, a private jet uh, to book. And uh, I, I do agree somehow on this number. While Uber has, uh, I don't know, some billions of potential customers. So I think it's completely uh, underestimated or overestimated how big the market is. And secondly, obviously, uh, it has been completely uh, overlooked how complex the backend is. So the platforms or the users we know in business aviation have built uh, actually a, a very nice front end. If you look at those, uh, the front end is really nice, but this is really just, you know, it's a, it's a facade and in the back uh, you have all the backend work. And then you had to hire, I don't know, hundreds of people to get the work done. And then this, this stopped the whole thing to scale up. I think we're all missing what Uber effectively is. And if you look at Uber as a massively overhyped, loss-making business, there are quite a lot in business aviation. Um, <laughs> Um, that would fit again, right? <laughs> you know, which is subs investors subsidizing um, transport. <coughs> um, here's a question which I quite like. I don't think this has happened before. Um, Bernhard made a comment in the last session that didn't get answered, so we'll go to it now. Um, there's a question from someone called Bernhard from Globair. Uh, where do we as an industry get all the tech experts required for this change? Annika, would you like to answer to Bernhard, who's sitting next to you? Where do we as an industry get the tech experts? Well, uh, there are a lot of tech companies uh, that you can get support from. Avanode itself is one of them, uh, obviously helping out to, to solve some of the challenges. But I think really what we need to look at is all these software companies that are popping up solving different needs in the industry. So I don't think there is one company solving everything. It's actually many companies coming together solving different issues. And by connecting systems together, you, uh, you create a holistic solution, but with different players in it. OK. Um, any old school questions from the audience during the tech panel? Um, semaphore at the back um, coming through. Uh, Matt. What technology are you most excited about this year? What do you think is going to make a difference to your business in 2019? This year we're looking at uh, software uh, being capable of optimizing the operation side. Yeah? Means <clears throat> to have uh, uh, something in place which can autom uh, automatize more on the, on the dispatch and flight planning side. Because presently I think this process is heavily dependent on humans and people. Um, it might be easier if you look at an intra-European level, but if you look at an, uh, let's say, world level and you fly everywhere, Pacific, Atlantic, etc., uh, then for sure there's something uh, which we would like to see and uh, looking at uh, to optimize yeah, and then uh, to cut costs on that side. James? Um, I'm, I'm really interested in how we can truly harness the sort of machine learning AI environment to, to take out some of the things that we know are predictable and fairly routine and, and then leave that human element that, that adds its own value to, to, the, to the system uh, and create a, a great deal of flexibility for, for people to, to work in this industry and uh, see how that goes. Bernhard? Uh, in 2018, we had 360,000 emails flipping back and forth to FBOs. So this is our number one priority to get the communication or the data flow between uh, us as operator and the FBOs automated because this is massive workload. 360,000 emails? 360,000 emails, just from our side. So wow. then usually you get a response. 
and out of office. Uh, and you also, you also launched voice last year, voice booking. Yeah, correct. So we introduced Alexa, uh, quite excited about that. And uh, we see people playing with it. So we had more than 100 inquiries since we launched a few weeks ago and uh, turned into six bookings. So it's, it's, it's small, but it's a great start. How many of those are children doing it by accident? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, parrot. Parrot. <laughs> it's one parrot, 300 of those. <laughs> Uh, Annika? Uh, so we are still on the route in trying to solve uh, the booking in the platform. Um, so working our way towards that and also facilitating collaboration through the platform between operators and brokers and trying to make those touch points easier and faster. Okay, final question uh, from Beatrice. Do you think there will always be need for personal touch in business aviation? James? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do. I think that um, I think that the future uh, technology is great and it solves a lot of problems. But you know, computers don't care about anything. Humans care about things. So I think that there is there is uh, always going to be that human touch. And and I think that as well, uh, some of the things where uh, you know you could have pilotless aircraft, but you could also just have single pilot aircraft with augmenting technology, virtual co-pilots additional co-pilots who are on the ground who can assist if there's a problem. So I think there's going to always be that human element. And in fact, I think the new economies that are coming in the future will be much more about that kind of thing. Anyone want to disagree? Yeah, Ben, I disagree. Tell him it's all about computers. <laughs> no. uh, yesterday was in a Uber ride. You know, and uh, when uh, I was at the destination, he, the driver asked me, can you give me a good rating? So there is always a human element to it. Great. Anyway, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much.